Together, we've all had a full and stimulating day, as you said. Uh, and I find it remarkable that the parallel between what we've been talking about all day and what we see across the pond in the colonies, as you would call it. Uh, and in, in the world of, of today's internet, social media, and a global economy, everything is all connected. Ten years ago, as I reflect back when I was president and CEO and at the helm of Rady Children's Hospital, if you had asked me about our carbon footprint or what our impact on the environment was, I would have given you a blank look. It simply wasn't on my radar screen. But the good news is that's all changing. The environment, healthcare impact on the environment is now becoming from the fringe to mainstream. Healthcare leaders are really increasingly aware of this important connection between the quality of care delivered and the physical environments in which that care takes place. They're also recognizing the powerful connection between healthcare organizations and our overall environment, indeed, the very planet itself. So many more than 10 years ago, I got my postgraduate degree in architecture here in London at the Architectural Association where I studied in the first wave of sustainable design. I then started designing hospitals and began this process of connecting. Today, I spend most of my time trying to get people in the world of green building and people in the world of healthcare to realize that they share a common mission, which is to protect and promote health. But as Blair said, never have we seen this landscape changing so fast. And we love this Rupert Murdoch quote because really it, it will not any longer be big beating small. It will be the fast beating the slow. And I think that has been one of the themes of the day. So is all this rapid change daunting, connectedness, complexity, speed? So how do we make sense of all this? So in order to navigate through this period of radical redesign, Robin and I have come up with 10 rules to serve as guideposts for designing truly healing environments. They are based on our article in the February issue of the Future Hospital Journal. So let's examine them together. Rule 10, better buildings cost more initially, but less over time. The evidence is in, you all know it, building better hospitals does improve care to patients and families while improving the work environment for staff. But do better hospitals cost more or less? And does improving care save money? Well, you know, no one really knew. So a decade ago, a multidisciplinary group set out to answer that question, putting all the components of proven design innovations together to create a mythical 300-bed fable hospital. While it had not been built in its entirety, all the components of it had been. They actually existed. And the actual cost-benefit data existed for each of the individual design innovations. The Fable Hospital analysis showed that better buildings cost more to construct, but by including design strategies that help reduce infections, falls, medication errors, sleep deprivation, and workforce injuries, better buildings actually save money over time. So the lessons from Fable, a one-time incremental construction cost of $12 million on a $240 million project, about 5%, would be recovered through reduced operating costs within two to three years. In 2011, we updated the analysis using new evidence-based design innovations and construction cost estimates to describe Fable 2.0. The business case was even stronger. The one-time construction cost of $29 million, 84.4% of $300 million, yielded annual operating savings of over $10 million, annual operating savings. Again, a tremendous payback in just three years. Now, when Peace Health replaced their flagship hospital in Eugene, Oregon, they fully embraced design innovations described in Fable. Their post-occupancy research revealed numerous benefits, including <laughs> reduced length of stay despite increased patient acuity, 
reduced cost per adjusted discharge of over 5%, and dramatic increases in patient satisfaction. The message is clear. Better healthcare environments cost more to build, but save significant operating costs year after year. And when you include improved patient and staff satisfaction, the positive return on investment is absolutely enormous. So why doesn't everyone do this? Well, despite the persuasiveness of the fable analysis, there are still barriers to overcome. And one of the most important leads us to rule number nine. Become bilingual. It is necessary for healthcare design professionals, clinicians, and financial professionals to understand each other's perspectives and find a common language. And that's about light green and dark green dollars, or maybe pounds or euros, whatever your currency might be. Now, light green and dark green dollars is a concept developed about 10 years ago by Maureen Bisignano at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Light green dollars and dark green dollars. Light green are theoretical savings. Savings from safety quality improvements may theoretically exist. <coughs> Fewer infections in patients falls actually do cost less. But if hospitals and physicians are still paid for the additional care required or there is no reduction in costs from harm avoided, there is no real savings to the hospital. And so these are what we call light green dollars. Ann Hendrick, who many of you know her work, at Clarion Methodist Hospital in Indianapolis, designed a cardiac intensive care unit with all 55 acuity adoptable rooms to replace a 60 bed unit with three levels of acuity. She was able to reduce patient room transfers from one part of the unit to another by 90%. And when she analyzed the costs of not incurred by avoiding the 27 steps at a cost of $250 per transfer. She got a real big number, <coughs> over $3 million. But these are light green dollars. Unless the number of nursing staff hours or other labor costs were actually reduced as well, they would not convert to actually monetary savings in someone's cost center and become dark green. But if these theoretical savings can be converted into actual reductions, like labor costs, workman's compensation, then we have real measurable savings to the hospital, and they become dark green. So returning to Peace Health, the installation of hydraulic ceiling lifts on two units as part of a no-lift policy reduced back lift injuries virtually to zero, saving over $300,000 per year. Since the hospital was self-insured and they could identify the actual reduction in paid claims, their identified savings were indeed dark green. The CEO and the CFO became ardent champions as well for making every room in their new 300-bed hospital lift ready. In addition, efforts by hospitals to become environmentally sustainable can save considerable operating costs over time. This recent US study, using actual data from participating hospitals, demonstrated that the aggregate savings <coughs> from modest reductions in energy use, toxic waste, and more efficient use of surgical equipment and supplies would be in excess of $5 billion in five years and $15 billion over 10 if applied to the entire U.S. healthcare system. So the bottom line, we must communicate regularly and often, become bilingual to often understand how better environments actually improve care and reduce costs. So if every one of these great innovative ideas cost more capital dollars but deliver operational savings, how do owners and design teams choose between them? Which leads us really to rule number eight. And that's to move from silos to synergy or as a number of speakers have talked about today, to move from a single aim to a triple aim. So health systems around the world have begun to, to shift their focus from the care or the care of an individual patient to the triple aim of experience of care that includes both quality and the experience of receiving that care, uh, population health, and per capita cost. 
In the US, there are pilot payment systems as a result of the Affordable Care Act that are beginning to reward hospitals that adopt the triple aim. In his 2012 keynote address at CleanMed, Don Berwick made the point that environmental sustainability doesn't just relate to the triple aim, it redefines the triple aim. So what did he mean? You know, Blair's examples in the earlier rules begin to get at some of that. But I want to talk about a few others. When Kaiser Permanente institutes on-site farmers markets on their hospital campuses, they are providing healthy food choices for their staff and their members. They're also shifting their purchasing power from an industrial agriculture system that relies on antibiotics and growth hormones, which are clearly a healthcare quality issue, as was mentioned earlier today, to a sustainable and local system that supports healthier food choice. That's population health. That's triple aim thinking. At Seattle Children's, when they implemented this transportation plan with the goal of actually reducing single occupancy vehicle commutes from 60% of their staff to 30% of their staff, so cut them in half, the, the triple aim values that they got to were improved employee engagement, which we all know translates to better care. That's come up a few times today as well as both the health benefits from reduced emissions around their campus from the vehicles, and last but not least, lower parking subsidies for their staff. So it again hit on every one of those triple aim values. And when Gunderson Health System made the announcement that they were gonna become the first energy independent healthcare system in the US, they didn't express that goal around environmental benefit. They use this sort of triple aim framing to make the air better for our patients, to control our rising energy costs, and to support the local economy. So Gunderson has done a whole series of community partnerships in renewable energy, from wind to harvesting brewery waste, as well as landfill, and yes, even cow manure in Wisconsin, to shift their energy sources from fossil fuel to renewables. Again, the thing that they realized and what made this really triple aim for them was that it shifted the perception of them in their community from being actually a cost center among the local employers to being an organization that really cared about the health of everyone in the community as well as their staff. Triple aim thinking. So in order actually to get to triple aim, Hospitals really have to understand all their impacts and manage them. And that actually leads us to rule number seven, which is to embrace radical transparency. Uh, ra radical transparency has really come into its own in the last decade. We've heard it talked about here again today, but mostly transparency around care quality. So right now I'm gonna take a kind of different journey of transparency, but it's really about increasing openness, communication, and accountability for impacts. The Harvard Business Review did this cover story on leadership in the age of transparency a couple years ago, where they talked about how leading businesses are taking ownership of the impacts that are directly traceable to their organization, like the fossil fuel impacts or the care quality issues that we've heard about today taking action on those impacts that they contribute to and have some problem-solving competence. I would put the food example and the transportation example into that bucket. And last but not least, taking interest in the ripple effects. Those of you who were here this morning when David Pension talked about the manufacture of surgical instruments, that's a ripple effect. So, um, as we look at this, the, I want to talk really about the movement in this. First of all, there's the amazing work that the UK NHS did by publishing that carbon footprint so many years ago. That's taking action. You, you kind of catalog all your impacts, you publish it, and then you make a commitment to reduce those impacts by 80%. 
Sometimes radical transparency can build a community of practice. The fact that the UK NHS did that led the Journal of the American Medical Association to actually try to quantify the US carbon footprint of healthcare. They actually calculated that it was 8.3% of the total US carbon footprint. And I'll tell you all here, if that's true, then US healthcare, if it were a country, would be the 10th largest carbon emitter on the planet. So if you don't measure, you can't manage. So again, and, and I think as this ripples out, you begin to see people like the British Medical Association thinking, and the individual doctor thinking, well, I can't really do anything about the carbon footprint of the NHS. But as a group of physicians, we can decide to divest from fossil fuel. And that's really the beginning, the ripples that transparency does. I also want to talk for a second about a topic that hasn't really come up today, and that is transparency in building materials. Because, of course, I'm an architect, so I get to talk about building materials. But the American Academy of Pediatrics really began to focus on this idea of the first thousand days of life and what are the environmental exposures of children in utero and then when they're first born, and really has begun to worry about the health effects of chemicals. The problem is that we don't really know what kind of chemicals we're surrounded with, whether it's in this room, in a nursery, wherever, in a school, in a work environment. My firm did this precautionary list in the US, which is beginning to chronicle 25 substances that we don't think should be in building products. Because in the absence of knowing what's in the product, all you can begin to do is ask people to tell you if any of these things are in a product. And we joined actually this really complicated group of organizations that are trying to get their hands around what chemicals are in building products that would have adverse health effects. And it's become such a complicated landscape that people have to do these Venn diagrams to figure out who's working on which ones. But the point of this really is that it's leading to the first uh, voluntary self-reporting tool, the Health Product Declaration, that global building product manufacturers are now beginning to voluntarily use as a reporting mechanism. And so we're about to get a landslide of information on building products and begin to see how that impacts reformulation. And what do healthcare owners do about that? Kaiser Permanente actually became the first system to pledge to stop buying flame retardant furniture, really as a result, again, of this transparency movement. And they were rapidly joined by others. So in this connected age, organizations are feeling increasingly naked. So as Jim Reinertsen from IHI, a good friend of both of ours, says, if you're going to be naked, you better be buff. Radical transparency has arrived. So what does it mean? It means you have to know your impact, uh, favor improvement, and share what you learn. So that leads us, actually, to rule number six, which is about anticipating disruptive innovation. In the nursing unit meeting today, lots of people talked about disruptive thinking. And this is really, again, about how do we think about technologies and improvements that enter the marketplace and, and disrupt established markets. They're often threatening to established markets. My favorite example, which is a blast from the past now, is the iPod. Remember those? When the iPod on the left came out, the music industry did not see it as a threat. They thought it was laughable that anyone would think that the music quality through those earbud headphones would actually inspire anyone to buy that device. I guess they were wrong. And, and clearly what we learned is that convenience and accessibility trumps all, whether it's the Kindle and carrying a thousand books or those thousand songs on your pocket device. This is not a situation lost on healthcare. Clayton Christensen, the father of disruptive innovation, says this about healthcare, that healthcare is actually um, ripe for disruptive innovation. It's not simply about decentralization, but he says it's because it's remained centralized, expensive, 
and that its sick care focus has become increasingly irrelevant to large numbers of people. So um, witness a disruptive innovation in US healthcare, you know, uh, microclinics in Walmarts. Again, people voting for convenience. And certainly, Kaiser Permanente has been studying and implementing microclinics for about a decade. They did rapid prototyping in their innovation center, in their Garfield Center, and they figured out how to put two doctors in a shopping mall with two exam rooms, uh, an electronic medical record, nothing else, no receptionist, no radiology, they didn't even, actually, as I said, they didn't have a receptionist. They had people like check in with their Kaiser member card at a kiosk. And what did they find? That the, that the clinic actually worked. That these two providers working in that situation could actually deliver 80% of what a patient needed for about 20% of the standard investment. So if that sounds familiar, that's the Pareto principle. It's the 80-20 rule that 80% of, of the value can be delivered by 20% of the investment. And this is actually a lesson that those other health systems that flashed across your screen in the US are getting. But you know, it's not simply innovating the ambulatory environment that sometimes these disruptions happen inside the hospital. So whether you look at Fourth Valley Hospital, the first one in Scotland to implement robots for uh, pharmacy and food service delivery, or Japan, where robots are now doing environmental services, or the one on the lower right, where, where in some US hospitals, um, robots actually are care partners through video conferencing. Uh, you know, it's all beginning to happen. So, but pondering the future of disruptive innovation leads to a central question. So let's pause and consider this together. Don Berwick wrote a foreword to a book I co-authored, and in it, he describes an exercise that Gene Houston, a colleague of his, uses with audiences, like this. Reading it had a profound impact on me, and we decided to share it with you now. The exercise begins with the question, what do you want from healthcare? A second question follows, what do you really want? He waits a moment, and then he asks, what do you really, really want? Like him, when I tried it myself, it was powerful. But where does this question take you? Don says that when he asks an audience, what do they want? with respect to their health and health care. They buzz happily in conversations with their neighbors about quality of care or safety or responsiveness, many things we talked about today. But when he asks, what do you really want, the buzzing softens, and faces get serious, contemplative, curious. I want my pain to go away. I want comfort and dignity, the company of loved ones. When he asks, what do you really, really want, the silence lasts longer. Some wipe their eyes. They all look serious, lost in thought. They too are thinking about families and places to walk and music and peaceful places. And like Don, they may be thinking about a favorite holiday. Don reminds us, healthcare is not an end, it is a means. In and of itself, it has no value whatever. So he asks us to dig deep. With respect to health and healthcare, what do you really, really want? Pills? I doubt it. Cure? Actually not. Comfort and zest? Closer, but not quite it either. With time and encouragement, if the stakes were really, really, most of us would probably end up in similar places. Places of joy and hope and reassurance and even inspiration. Wouldn't you? So Robin and I believe that takes us directly to rule number five. Create an environment of care that people really, really want. Creating environments that people really, really want, we believe, will be the key to 21st century health care. And this applies equally to the care we receive and to the people who provide that care. 
In their book that you probably know well, The Experience Economy, Pine and Gilmore chronicle the evolution moving past delivering goods and services to providing truly engaging experiences. They believe that when people really, really want is to be transformed and value those who actually guide that transformation. What healthcare consumers really want is to be transformed from illness to health. They want to be well. So what is an ideal hospital or health experience? We believe environments that cause no needless harm, anxiety, confusion, noise, sleep deprivation, or lack of privacy are what patients really, really want. And this belief applies equally to the care we receive as patients and to the people who provide it. Business consultant Lance Secretan said it well, there's not an actual nursing shortage, there's a shortage of places that nurses want to work. And who can blame them, considering the kind of environments we've often created for them? So contrast our current reality with this vision created by a small community hospital in rural Pennsylvania. I think I'd like to get my care in a place like this. So here's some examples of creating environments that people really, really want. Reduce noise, which has become a major hospital issue. In the US, standards are converging around the WHO guidelines, eliminating the built environment's contribution to sleep deprivation. Give people the choice of the music they want to listen to. It calms them and provides an important sense of control. Serve people healthy and nutritious food to model behavior that helps them transform their eating habits and maybe grow some of that food on your roof. Create positive distractions like this MRI back home in San Diego at Rady Children's, which is filled, as you can see, with playful images and gives our young patients the choice of what music they want to listen to. Construct with natural and low emitting materials that can be maintained with non-toxic cleaning products. Improve the indoor air quality. Or connect over a hundred lonely and isolated elders in adult daycare, many of whom suffer from Alzheimer's disease, with over 100 energetic sixth graders and create Soul Shoes, an exhibit where children and elders decorated shoes together, told stories about them, and created public dance performances to celebrate their creations. In infuse nature deep into clinical areas in unexpected places, like in this emergency department where a courtyard replaces what in most emergency rooms is clean and soiled utilities. and convert unused roof spaces into healing gardens that patients and staff benefit from. No one has captured the power of this idea better than this 12-year-old who wrote this in the visitor's log in that garden. Coming here was the best medicine. These examples demonstrate that, as Leland Kaiser said, spaces are not passive containers. They are active radiators. Isn't that wonderful? They project emotional, mental, and spiritual content. So a few years ago, I wondered what Don Berwick would think was a perfect hospital. And so I asked him. And so let's have a look from a video produced by the Agency for Healthcare Quality and Research. Try to think about a perfectly designed hospital, and it would be more reliable, fewer mistakes, fewer drop-offs, so everything would There'd be precision, promises kept. It would be peaceful, healing, a quiet place where patients can use their limited energy to get better instead of to fight the environment. And most especially, the loved ones of the patients are there all the time. There'd be a sense of things in their place and a place for everything. I think it would be simpler. I think the, the, the clutter and the complexity and the machines and the bells and the whistles need to be 
managed out of the care. I think it would feel more like home, probably, and therefore it has to be more customized. And somehow all of this resting on science, because we're there in a technical enterprise that has to use knowledge and machines and drugs correctly, so underneath all is confidence that we're gonna do the right thing every single time. So how do we get to that vision? I think that brings us to rule number four. It's about health, not health care. Today, healthcare delivery is not particularly focused on health. Instead, we've created a sick care system that's so focused on curing advanced stages of disease that it's, as I said, largely irrelevant to many health needs. We've been obsessed with hospitals as the ultimate healthcare delivery machine, building ever larger and more complicated towers of disease. This is the Texas Medical Center, the largest in the world. With 106,000 employees at 26 institutions co-located on one and a half square miles, it looks like the size of downtown Houston. And, and the difficult and inconvenient truth for us is that this really is an industrial system. It's a 20th century industrial system, like agriculture, chemicals, or fossil fuel. And like those systems, it creates waste, some pretty dismal work environments, as Lance Secretan pointed out, and a load of externalized impacts. It actually contributes, in many ways, to the problems it's there to solve. So while we seek to perfect those care environments, we're dumping pharmaceuticals in the water, disposable products in landfills, and greenhouse gases up the chimneys. These all contribute to, to environmental health issues and degradation, and they are really all preventable. So what does it mean to shift the focus on health, to health? When healthcare shifts its focus to health, we move upstream from the causes of disease to the causes of health. And as we do that, we begin to take responsibility, as we talked about in the transparency, for all those impacts and, and sort of nail them one at a time. When I, I, when I did my book, Gary Cohen wrote this essay in my book where he said, you know, the hospital can situate itself in the ecology of its community and act as a force for healing. So I want to look at some examples of healthcare that's doing that. First, Waldron Health maybe a project familiar to many of you, it's here in London, but, but where health and social services partner in a new way to put health management at the focus of a new civic architecture and create a new town square that celebrates health in the middle of civic life. When health systems shift to supporting the conditions for health, they join with their communities in kind of new and innovative ways, like this example from Anchorage, Alaska, where they actually coined a new word for a health system based on health management encounters rather than sick care. And often as they move upstream, they engage in improving the living and working conditions of their populations. So my favorite example of this in the United States is the Cleveland Clinic, featured in Forbes for whether it can save its hometown. But where the Cleveland Clinic and other healthcare organizations in, in Cleveland have actually started employee-owned local cooperative businesses, moving their purchasing dollars into the devastated neighborhoods that surround their campuses as a sort of form of building social and economic cohesion. So what does this focus on health have to do with quality? Blair and I think it has just about everything, which brings us really to rule number three, and a rule that David 
Pension sort of touched on this morning but didn't really go into, which is how do we actually talk about how sustainability and quality go together? I believe here that if we use health as the inspiration to transform our practices, we can heal our hospitals and the planet. Because every innovation needs to be informed by an inspiration, and quite frankly, health as an inspiration has been missing for many of the, of the movements we've had in this generation. The last speaker talked about health not being a quality of urban design. So how do we begin to do this? As healthcare connects with healing the earth and healing people, it needs to continue to make the point that we're not gonna have healthy people on a sick planet if we don't have clean air, clean water, and healthy soil. In less than a decade, this is the story I'm gonna tell about this, in less than a decade, an organization called Healthcare Without Harm mobilized the global healthcare community over the mercury issue, mercury, and managed to actually get the Global Minamata Treaty in 2013, where 100 nations and all these organizations that are too small for you to read on this slide agreed to phase out mercury in healthcare. Now what's interesting to me about this story is that it wasn't one government, it wasn't led by one organization. It was simply a sort of recognition by the healthcare sector that this chemical needed to go. And, and the global healthcare sector. And I think it's a good model for us as we move forward with what David talked about this morning. So in, in 2000, um, it, well, I'll, I'll stay here first, that environmental sustainability has to be a key tenet of quality improvement as we move forward. Because as David said, we're soiling the planet and it really can't go on. The Pope made that point in his encyclical last week. It's really coming full circle for us in the health sector. And in 2009, as David mentioned this morning, the Lancet Commission did the study that said climate change is the biggest global health threat. And I like this picture from the climate march in New York last year because this was really one of the big points the Pope made last week. That the people who are most affected by this are the people who have contributed the least to the problem and have the least resources to deal with it. So what's the role for the health sector in that? Tomorrow, the Lancet Commission will release another report and it will be even stronger about how all of us in the health sector need to come together around this issue for everyone on the planet. And I hope that we all can do that as a result of this because it is that moment. And certainly health systems are doing it. Kaiser Permanente recognizing that climate change is a healthcare quality issue because of the uncertainty of food supply, clean water, et cetera. Um, and I think that the other place that this really shows up is around the resilience of, of the healthcare system. Certainly in the US, we have the most unpredictable weather of any continent on the planet, so we certainly have our share of tragic shutdowns of our healthcare system, despite all the money that we spend on it. So it is time for us to recognize that healthcare has to stay operational through all this climate crisis, and it has to continue to deliver quality care. With 60% of its staff in place, with 20% of the resources, it's gotta keep moving. So how are we gonna prepare for that and become inherently more resilient? In 2013, President Obama issued the Climate Action Plan in the US calling for hospitals to become more sustainable and resilient, and lots of people are doing new tools and resources for that. On the Boston waterfront, the first building on the Boston waterfront to be constructed that takes into account sea level rise and is built upside down to keep running no matter what is a hospital. 
And that actually leads us to rule number two. Become an early adopter. David also talked about risk-averse leadership. To be fully engaged in creating innovation, you have to become an early adopter to take some risks. Around the world, <laughs> healthcare organizations are shifting practice to embrace environmental and human health and community in new and exciting ways. I believe you're all familiar with the Rogers Innovation Curve that shows where early adopters live. But <coughs> hockey player Wayne Gretzky may well have said it best, I skate to where the puck is going, not where it is. How did you do that? <coughs> In the US, 13 major systems, early adopters, have sponsored the Healthier Hospital Initiative. 1,200 hospital members are focusing on one or more of six challenges, engaged leadership, healthier food, less waste, safer chemicals, leaner energy, and smarter purchasing. They've just completed their milestone report after three years of experience. I commend it to you. It is extraordinarily amazing what has been done. Globally, more than 12,500 hospitals worldwide have joined the Global Green and Healthy Hospitals Network, which asks that healthcare organizations adopt at least two of the following 10 goals. Together, these initiatives define a robust learning community from which early adopters can both learn and lead. Earlier this month, GGHH announced a global 2020 healthcare carbon challenge with participants pledging carbon reduction of 30% or more in the next five years. Early adopters have one thing in common. They do their homework. They learn from innovators, and they push the envelope. They take a risk. They jump, and they deliver. In so doing, they make their own places better by sharing their lessons learned, both successes and failures. They transform healthcare and make a world, our world a better place. They have the courage to withstand the skepticism and the cynics, what if this doesn't work, and move forward. Let's all join them. So, by now, are you all exhausted on what we've laid on you? <laughs> and hopefully encourage you to consider, does it feel like a drink of water from a fire hose? Well, we're not quite finished yet. We want to raise the bar even higher and invite you to another level. We want to go from good, indeed very good, to great. And that takes us to our very favorite rule, rule number one. To reinvent healthcare through regenerative design. So this is really about taking a major and vital leap, like the goldfish, from doing the best that we know to worlds that are just beginning to unfold. And, and I want to start by talking about the farmer and philosopher Wendell Berry in the US, who says that when health is the aim, a good solution acts like a healthy organ acts within the body. These solutions fix problems without making new ones. They create a kind of cascading series of benefits instead of all those negative externalized impacts. There's an emerging movement in architecture called restorative or regenerative design that's very much about finding those solutions. But its ideas actually can be applied to virtually every operational system in healthcare, not just to buildings. It's really about moving from so-called solutions that do less harm, maybe, but still degrade health and the environment to true solutions that do no harm and sometimes even heal some of the harm that's already been done. It's about finding solutions that stop making us sick. It's about finding solutions that improve resilience to the future climate challenges of our time. And what I like best about it is it's about finding solutions that move beyond doing less harm. Because as designer and architect William McDonough says, is to be less bad is to believe that poorly designed dishonorable systems are the best we can do as human beings. We know we can do better. So I'd like you to think for a moment 
about and imagine for a moment what the world would look like if the delivery of health care created nothing but health. And as you do that, I want us all here in kind of our close of this rule to think about committing to a new, a 21st century version of the Hippocratic Oath, that a health system shall cause neither human nor ecological harm. Can we imagine that world? And what can each of us do globally to bring that world into being? The NHS is really beginning down that road. And in the brochure that David, I think, left this morning is this amazing graphic about really repositioning healthcare as a custodian of planetary health. It's about moving beyond the four walls of hospitals into our communities, our boardrooms, and government to position health as the aim of everything we do. And in the US, Kaiser's courage to reimagine the small hospital provides an additional example of this vision in practice. This is actually the small hospital of the future. And it's that, this is its lobby. What's interesting about this lobby is that it is a health management nexus with healthy eating restaurants, exercise centers, and a genius bar for tuning your Kaiser app on the left, or to come in for just a kind of tune-up on your health, while the columns are displaying real-time community health statistics. How's our cholesterol, et cetera? This is a future that celebrates the hospital truly as new civic architecture. So the worlds of healthcare, architecture, and the arts, and the environment are coming together in new and profoundly powerful ways. It is all connected. We are all connected. And the light of awareness has been turned on. Environments that people really, really want are emerging. They no longer degrade health and well-being. They become environments that help people create actual joy in work, places that represent a new way of thinking about the role of health and health care in our communities and our lives. So consider this vision so beautifully articulated by the NHS. Imagine a time when going to a hospital is seen as a failing of the health and social care system. Imagine a place where the few buildings that support the health system are in tune with the environment. They use almost no carbon and are integrated into the community with nature. Imagine knowing that we have done our best to improve health and minimize our impact on the environment. So let's have the courage, creativity, and compassion to embrace this new world of competitiveness together. So capturing this vision will be difficult, but it is all of our work ahead. And together, we can create really authentic stories of health and use those stories to propel us forward into a 21st century reawakening of healthcare. Together, we believe we can build a healthcare system that creates nothing but health. It's not too expensive, it's not too difficult. There are people working on almost anything that you could imagine doing. So you don't necessarily have to be the first one. And it's time really is now. As W.E.B. Dubois said, now is the time. Thank you very much.